Book 6. So the grim encounter of Achaeans and Trojans was left to itself, and the battle veered greatly now one way, now in another, over the plain as they guided their bronze spears at each other in the space between the waters of Xanthos and Simoes. First Telamonian Aias, that bastion of the Achaeans, broke the Trojan battalions and brought light to his own company, striking down the man who was far the best of the Thracians, Akamas, the huge and mighty, the son of Eusoros. Throwing first, he struck the horn of the horse-haired helmet and the bronze spearpoint fixed in his forehead and drove inward through the bone, and a mist of darkness clouded both eyes. Dions of the Great War Cry cut down Axelos, Tuthra's son, who had been a dweller in strong-founded Arisbe, a man rich in substance and a friend to all humanity since in his house by the wayside he entertained all comers. Yet there was none of these now to stand before him and keep off the sad destruction, and Diams stripped life from both of them, Axelos and his henchman Calesios, who was the driver guiding his horses, so down to the underworld went both men. Now Euryalo slaughtered Ophelsios and Dressos, and went in pursuit of Isipos and Pedasos, those whom the Naiad Nymphababa had borne to blameless Bucolian. Bucolian himself was the son of haughty Laomedon, eldest born, but his mother conceived him in darkness and secrecy. While shepherding his flocks he lay with the nymph and loved her, and she conceiving bore him twin boys. But now Machistio's son unstrung the strength of these and the limbs in their glory, Euryalos, and stripped the armor away from their shoulders. Polypoites the stubborn in battle cut down Astialos, while Odyssea slaughtered one from Pacote, Pidites, with the bronze spear, and great Aetaeon was killed by two crows. Nestor's son Antilochos with the shining shaft killed Abelros, the lord of men, Agamemnon, brought death to Elatos, whose home had been on the shores of Satnios lovely waters, sheer Pedasos. And Latos the fighter caught Philicos as he ran away, and Eurypylos made an end of Melanthios. Now Menelos of the Great War Cry captured Adrestos alive, for his two horses bolting over the level land got entangled in a tamarisk growth, and shattered the curving chariot at the tip of the pole, so they broke and free went on toward the city, where many besides stampeded in terror. So Adrestos was whirled beside the wheel from the chariot headlong into the dust on his face, and the son of Atreus, Menelos, with the far-shadowed spear in his hand, stood over him. But Adrestos, catching him by the knees, supplicated, Take me alive, son of Atreus, and take appropriate ransom. In my rich father's house the treasures lie piled in abundance, bronze is there, and gold, and difficultly wrought iron, and my father would make you glad with abundant repayment were he to hear that I am alive by the ships of the Achaeans. So he spoke, and moved the spirit inside Menelos. And now he was on the point of handing him to a henchman to lead back to the fast Achaean ships, but Agamemnon came on the run to join him and spoke his word of argument, Dear brother, O Menelos, are you concerned so tenderly with these people? Did you in your house get the best of treatment from the Trojans? No, let not one of them go free of sudden death and our hands, not the young man-child that the mother carries still in her body, not even he, but let all of Ilion's people perish, utterly blotted out and unmourned for. The hero spoke like this, and bent the heart of his brother since he urged justice. Menelos shoved with his hand Adrestos the warrior back from him, and powerful Agamemnon stabbed him in the side and, as he writhed over, a trades, setting his heel upon the midriff, wrenched out the ash spear. Nestor in a great voice cried out to the men of Argos, O beloved Dane and fighters, henchmen of ours, let no man any more hang back with his eye on the plunder designing to take all the spoil he can gather back to the vessels, let us kill the men now, and afterward at your leisure all along the plain you can plunder the perished corpses. So he spoke, and stirred the spirit and strength in each man. Then once more would the Trojans have climbed back into Ilion's wall, subdued by terror before the warlike Achaeans, had not Priam's son, Helenus, best by far of the augurs, stood beside Aeneas and Hector and spoken a word to them, Hector and Aeneas, on you beyond others is leaning the battlework of Trojans and Lycians, since you are our greatest in every course we take, whether it be in thought or in fighting, stand your ground here, visit your people everywhere, hold them fast by the gates, before they tumble into their women's arms, and become to our enemies a thing to take joy in. Afterward, when you have set all the battalions in motion, the rest of us will stand fast here and fight with the Danans though we are very hard hit indeed, necessity forces us, but you, Hector, go back again to the city, and there tell your mother and mine to assemble all the ladies of honor at the temple of grey-eyed Athene high on the citadel, there opening with a key the door to the sacred chamber let her take a robe, which seems to her the largest and loveliest in the great house, and that which is far her dearest possession, and lay it along the knees of Athene the lovely-haired. 
Let her promise to dedicate within the shrine twelve heifers, yearlings, never broken, if only she will have pity on the town of Troy, and the Trojan wives, and their innocent children. So she might hold back from sacred Ilion the son of Tydeus, that wild spear fighter, the strong one who drives men to thoughts of terror, who I say now is become the strongest of all the Achaeans. For never did we so fear Achilles even, that leader of men, who they say was born of a goddess. This man has gone clean berserk, so that no one can match his warcraft against him. So he spoke, and Hector did not disobey his brother, but at once in all his armor leapt to the ground from his chariot and shaking two sharp spears in his hands ranged over the whole host stirring them up to fight and waking the ghastly warfare. So they whirled about and stood their ground against the Achaeans, and the Argives gave way backward and stopped their slaughtering, and thought some one of the immortals must have descended from the starry sky to stand by the Trojans, the way they rallied. But Hector lifted his voice and cried aloud to the Trojans, You high-hearted Trojans and far-renowned companions, be men now, dear friends, and remember your furious valour until I can go back again to Ilion, and there tell the elder men who sit as counsellors, and our own wives, to make their prayer to the immortals and promise them hecatoms. So spoke Hector of the shining helm, and departed, and against his ankles as against his neck clashed the dark ox hide, the rim running round the edge of the great shield massive in the middle. Now Glaucos, sprung of Hippolochos, and the son of Tydeus came together in the space between the two armies, battle-bent. Now as these advancing came to one place and encountered, first to speak was Diams of the great war cry, who among mortal men are you, good friend. Since never before have I seen you in the fighting where men win glory, yet now you have come striding far out in front of all others in your great heart, who have dared stand up to my spear far-shadowing. Yet unhappy are those whose sons match warcraft against me. But if you are some one of the immortals come down from the bright sky, know that I will not fight against any god of the heaven, since even the son of Dryas, like Ergos the powerful, did not live long, he who tried to fight with the gods of the bright sky, who once drove the fosterers of rapturous Dionysos headlong down the sacred Nicaean hill, and all of them shed and scattered their wands on the ground, stricken with an ox goad by murderous Lycurgos, while Dionysos in terror dived into the Salt surf, and the tease took him to her bosom, frightened, with the strong shivers upon him at the man's blustering. But the gods who live at their ease were angered with Lycurgos, and the son of Cronos struck him to blindness, nor did he live long afterward, since he was hated by all the immortals. Therefore neither would I be willing to fight with the blessed gods, but if you are one of those mortals who eat what the soil yields, come nearer, so that sooner you may reach your appointed destruction. Then in turn the shining son of Hippolochos answered, High-hearted son of Tydeus, why ask of my generation? As is the generation of leaves, so is that of humanity. The wind scatters the leaves on the ground, but the live timber burgeons with leaves again in the season of spring returning. So one generation of men will grow while another dies. Yet if you wish to learn all this and be certain of my genealogy, there are plenty of men who know it. There is a city, Epha, in the corner of horse-pasturing Argos, there lived Sisyphos, that sharpest of all men, Sisyphos, Iolo's son, and he had a son named Glaucos, and Glaucos in turn sired Bellerophons the blameless. To Bellerophons the gods granted beauty and desirable manhood, but Proitos in anger devised evil things against him, and drove him out of his own domain, since he was far greater, from the Argive country Zeus had broken to the sway of his scepter. Beautiful Antiae the wife of Proitos was stricken with passion to lie in love with him, and yet she could not beguile valiant Bellerophons, whose will was virtuous. So she went to Proitos the king and uttered her falsehood, Would you be killed, O Proitos? Then murder Bellerophons who tried to lie with me in love, though I was unwilling. So she spoke, and anger took hold of the king at her story. He shrank from killing him, since his heart was awed by such action, but sent him away to Lycia, and handed him murderous symbols, which he inscribed in a folding tablet, enough to destroy life, and told him to show it to his wife's father, that he might perish. Bellerophon went to Lycia in the blameless convoy of the gods, when he came to the running stream of Xanthos, and Lycia, the lord of wide Lycia tendered him full-hearted honour. Nine days he entertained him with sacrifice of nine oxen, but afterward when the rose fingers of the tenth dawn showed, then he began to question him, and asked to be shown the symbols, whatever he might be carrying from his son-in-law, Proitos. Then after he had been given his son-in-law's wicked symbols first he sent him away with orders to kill the chimera none might approach, a thing of immortal make, not human, lion fronted and snake behind, a goat in the middle, and snorting out the breath of the terrible flame of bright fire. He killed the chimera, obeying the portents of the immortals. 
Next after this he fought against the glorious Solomoy, and this he thought was the strongest battle with men that he entered, but third he slaughtered the Amazons, who fight men in battle. Now as he came back the king spun another entangling treachery, for choosing the bravest men in wide Lycia he laid a trap, but these men never came home thereafter since all of them were killed by blameless Bellerophons. Then when the king knew him for the powerful stock of the god, he detained him there, and offered him the hand of his daughter, and gave him half of all the kingly privilege. There too the men of Lycia cut out a piece of land, surpassing all others, fine plowland and orchard for him to administer. His bride bore three children to valiant Bellerophons, Isandros and Hippolochos and Laomea. Laomea lay in love beside Zeus of the councils and bore him godlike Sarpedon of the brazen helmet. But after Bellerophons was hated by all the immortals, he wandered alone about the plain of Aleos, eating his heart out, skulking aside from the trodden track of humanity. As for Isandros his son, as the insatiate of fighting killed him in close battle against the glorious Solomoy, while Artemis of the Golden Reigns killed the daughter in anger. But Hippolochos begot me, and I claim that he is my father, he sent me to Troy, and urged upon me repeated injunctions, to be always among the bravest, and hold my head above others, not shaming the generation of my fathers, who were the greatest men in Ephra and again in wide Lycia. Such is my generation and the blood I claim to be born from. He spoke, and Diams of the great war cry was gladdened. He drove his spear deep into the prospering earth, and in winning words of friendliness he spoke to the shepherd of the people, See now, you are my guest friend from far in the time of our fathers. Brilliant Oinius once was host to Bellerophons the blameless, in his halls, and twenty days he detained him, and these two gave to each other fine gifts in token of friendship. Oinius gave his guest a war belt bright with the red dye, Bellerophon a golden and double-handled drinking cup, a thing I left behind in my house when I came on my journey. Tidius, though, I cannot remember, since I was little when he left me, that time the people of the Achaeans perished in Thabe. Therefore I am your friend and host in the heart of Argos, you are mine in Lycia, when I come to your country. Let us avoid each other's spears, even in the close fighting. There are plenty of Trojans and famed companions in battle for me to kill, whom the god sends me, or those I run down with my swift feet, many Achaeans for you to slaughter, if you can do it. But let us exchange our armor, so that these others may know how we claim to be guests and friends from the days of our fathers. So they spoke, and both springing down from behind their horses gripped each other's hands and exchanged the promise of friendship, but Zeus the son of Crono stole away the wits of Glaucos who exchanged with Diams the son of Tydeus armor of gold for bronze, four nine oxen worth the worth of a hundred. Now as Hector had come to the Skyian gates and the oak tree, all the wives of the Trojans and their daughters came running about him to ask after their sons, after their brothers and neighbors, their husbands, and he told them to pray to the immortals, all, in turn, but there were sorrows in store for many. Now he entered the wonderfully built palace of Priam. This was fashioned with smooth stone cloister walks, and within it were embodied fifty sleeping chambers of smooth stone built so as to connect with each other, and within these slept each beside his own wedded wife, the sons of Priam. In the same inner court on the opposite side, to face these, lay the twelve close smooth stone sleeping chambers of his daughters built so as to connect with each other, and within these slept, each by his own modest wife, the lords of the daughters of Priam. There, there came to meet Hector his bountiful mother with Laodic, the loveliest looking of all her daughters. She clung to his hand and called him by name and spoke to him, Why then, child, have you come here and left behind the bold battle? Surely it is these accursed sons of the Achaeans who wear you out, as they fight close to the city, and the spirit stirred you to return, and from the peak of the citadel lift your hands, praying to Zeus. But stay while I bring you honey sweet wine, to pour out a libation to Father Zeus and the other immortals first, and afterward, if you will drink yourself, be strengthened. In a tired man, wine will bring back his strength to its bigness, in a man tired as you are tired, defending your neighbors. Tall Hector of the Shining Helm spoke to her, answering, My honored mother, lift not to me the kindly sweet wine, for fear you stagger my strength and make me forget my courage, and with hands unwashed I would take shame to pour the glittering wine to Zeus. There is no means for a man to pray to the dark misted son of Kronos, with blood and muck all spattered upon him. But go yourself to the temple of the spoiler Athene, assembling the ladies of honor, and with things to be sacrificed, and take a robe, which seems to you the largest and loveliest in the great house, and that which is far your dearest possession. Lay this along the knees of Athene the lovely-haired. 
also promised to dedicate within the shrine twelve heifers, yearlings, never broken, if only she will have pity on the town of Troy, and the Trojan wives, and their innocent children, if she will hold back from sacred Ilion the son of Tydeus, that wild spear fighter, the strong one who drives men to thoughts of terror. So go yourself to the temple of the spoiler Athene, while I go in search of Paris, to call him, if he will listen to anything I tell him. How I wish at this moment the earth might open beneath him. The Olympian let him live, a great sorrow to the Trojans, and high-hearted Priam, and all of his children. If only I could see him gone down to the house of the death god, then I could say my heart had forgotten its joyless affliction. So he spoke, and she going into the great house called out to her handmaidens, who assembled throughout the city the highborn women, while she descended into the fragrant store chamber. There lay the elaborately wrought robes, the work of Sidonian women, whom Alexandros himself, the godlike, had brought home from the land of Sidon, crossing the wide sea, on that journey when he brought back also gloriously descended Helen. Hecab lifted out one and took it as gift to Athene, that which was the loveliest in design and the largest, and shone like a star. It lay beneath the others. She went on her way, and a throng of noble women hastened about her. When these had come to Athene's temple on the peak of the citadel, the Aino of the fair cheeks opened the door for them, daughter of Kisius, and wife of Antinor, breaker of horses, she whom the Trojans had established to be Athene's priestess. With a wailing cry all lifted up their hands to Athene, and the Aino of the fair cheeks taking up the robe laid it along the knees of Athene the lovely haired, and praying she supplicated the daughter of powerful Zeus. O lady, Athene, our city's defender, shining among goddesses, break the spear of diamonds, and grant that the man be hurled on his face in front of the sky in gates, so may we instantly dedicate within your shrine twelve heifers, yearlings, never broken, if only you will have pity on the town of Troy, and the Trojan wives, and their innocent children. She spoke in prayer, but Pallas Athene turned her head from her. So they made their prayer to the daughter of Zeus the Powerful. But Hector went away to the house of Alexandros, a splendid place he had built himself, with the men who at that time were the best men for craftsmanship in the generous trode, who had made him a sleeping room and a hall and a courtyard near the houses of Hector and Priam, on the peak of the citadel. There entered Hector beloved of Zeus, in his hand holding the eleven cubit long spear, whose shaft was tipped with a shining bronze spearhead, and a ring of gold was hooped to hold it. He found the man in his chamber busy with his splendid armor, the corslet and the shield, and turning in his hands the curved bow, while Helen of Argos was sitting among her attendant women directing the magnificent work done by her handmaidens. But Hector saw him, and in words of shame he rebuked him, strange man. It is not fair to keep in your heart this coldness. The people are dying around the city and around the steep wall as they fight hard, and it is for you that this war with its clamor has flared up about our city. You yourself would fight with another whom you saw anywhere hanging back from the hateful encounter. Up then, to keep our town from burning at once in the hot fire. Then in answer the godlike Alexandro spoke to him, Hector, seeing you have scolded me rightly, not beyond measure, therefore I will tell, and you in turn understand and listen. It was not so much in coldness and bitter will toward the Trojans that I sat in my room, but I wished to give myself over to sorrow. But just now with soft words my wife was winning me over and urging me into the fight, and that way seems to me also the better one. Victory passes back and forth between men. Come then, wait for me now while I put on my armor of battle, or go, and I will follow, and I think I can overtake you. He spoke, but Hector of the Shining Helm gave him no answer, but Helen spoke to him in words of endearment, brother by marriage to me, who am a nasty bitch evil intriguing, how I wish that on that day when my mother first bore me the foul whirlwind of the storm had caught me away and swept me to the mountain, or into the wash of the sea deep thundering where the waves would have swept me away before all these things had happened. Yet since the gods had brought it about that these vile things must be, I wish I had been the wife of a better man than this is, one who knew modesty and all things of shame that men say. But this man's heart is no steadfast thing, nor yet will it be so ever hereafter, for that I think he shall take the consequence. But come now, come in and rest on this chair, my brother, since it is on your heart beyond all that the hard work has fallen for the sake of Dishon and me and the blind act of Alexandros, us too, on whom Zeus set a vile destiny, so that hereafter we shall be made into things of song for the men of the future. Then tall Hector of the shining helm answered her, Do not, Helen, make me sit with you, though you love me. You will not persuade me. Already my heart within is hastening me to defend the Trojans, who when I am away long greatly to have me. 
rather rouse this man, and let himself also be swift to action so he may overtake me while I am still in the city. For I am going first to my own house, so I can visit my own people, my beloved wife and my son, who is little, since I do not know if ever again I shall come back this way, or whether the gods will strike me down at the hands of the Achaeans. So speaking Hector of the Shining Helm departed and in speed made his way to his own well-established dwelling, but failed to find in the house Andromach of the White Arms, for she, with the child, and followed by one fair-robed attendant, had taken her place on the tower in lamentation, and tearful. When he saw no sign of his perfect wife within the house, Hector stopped in his way on the threshold and spoke among the handmaidens, Come then, tell me truthfully as you may, handmaidens, where has Andromach of the White Arms gone? Is she with any of the sisters of her lord or the wives of his brothers? Or has she gone to the house of Athene, where all the other lovely-haired women of Troy propitiate the grim goddess? Then in turn the hard-working housekeeper gave him an answer, Hector, since you have urged me to tell you the truth, she is not with any of the sisters of her lord or the wives of his brothers, nor has she gone to the house of Athene, where all the other lovely-haired women of Troy propitiate the grim goddess, but she has gone to the great bastion of Ilion, because she heard that the Trojans were losing, and great grew the strength of the Achaeans. Therefore she has gone in speed to the wall, like a woman gone mad, and a nurse attending her carries the baby. So the housekeeper spoke, and Hector hastened from his home backward by the way he had come through the well-laid streets. So as he had come to the gates on his way through the great city, the Scaean gates, whereby he would issue into the plain, there at last his own generous wife came running to meet him, Andromach, the daughter of high-hearted Eshan, Eshan, who had dwelt underneath wooded Plakos, in they below Plakos, lord over the Kilikian people. It was his daughter who was given to Hector of the bronze helm. She came to him there, and beside her went an attendant carrying the boy in the fold of her bosom, a little child, only a baby, Hector's son, the admired, beautiful as a star shining, whom Hector called Scamandrios, but all of the others Astyanax lord of the city, since Hector alone saved Ilion. Hector smiled in silence as he looked on his son, but she, Andromach, stood close beside him, letting her tears fall, and clung to his hand and called him by name and spoke to him, Dearest, your own great strength will be your death, and you have no pity on your little son, nor on me, ill-starred, who soon must be your widow, for presently the Achaeans, gathering together, will set upon you and kill you, and for me it would be far better to sink into the earth when I have lost you, for there, is no other consolation for me after you have gone to your destiny only grief, since I have no father, no honoured mother. It was brilliant Achilles who slew my father, Eshan, when he stormed the strong-founded citadel of the Calicians, they of the towering gates. He killed Eshan but did not strip his armour, for his heart respected the dead man, but burned the body in all its elaborate war gear and piled a grave mound over it, and the nymphs of the mountains, daughters of Zeus of the Aegis, planted elm trees about it. And they who were my seven brothers in the great house all went upon a single day down into the house of the death god, for swift-footed brilliant Achilles slaughtered all of them as they were tending their white sheep and their lumbering oxen, and when he had led my mother, who was queen under wooded Plakos, here, along with all his other possessions, Achilles released her again, accepting ransom beyond count, but Artemis of the showering arrows struck her down in the halls of her father. Hector, thus you are father to me, and my honoured mother, you are my brother, and you it is who are my young husband. Please take pity upon me then, stay here on the rampart, that you may not leave your child an orphan, your wife a widow, but draw your people up by the fig tree, there where the city is openest to attack, and where the wall may be mounted. Three times their bravest came that way, and fought there to storm it about the two Aeantes and renowned Idomeneus, about the two Atreidae and the fighting son of Tydeus. Either some man well skilled in prophetic arts had spoken, or the very spirit within themselves had stirred them to the onslaught. Then tall Hector of the Shining Helm answered her, All these things are in my mind also, lady, yet I would feel deep shame before the Trojans, and the Trojan women with trailing garments, if like a coward I were to shrink aside from the fighting, and the spirit will not let me, since I have learned to be valiant and to fight always among the foremost ranks of the Trojans, winning for my own self great glory, and for my father. For I know this thing well in my heart, and my mind knows it, there will come a day when sacred Ilion shall perish, and Priam, and the people of Priam of the strong ash spear. But it is not so much the pain to come of the Trojans that troubles me, not even of Priam the king nor Hecab, not the thought of my brothers who in their numbers and valor shall drop in the dust under the hands of men who hate them, as troubles me the thought of you, when some bronze-armored Achaean leads you off, taking away your day of liberty, in tears, and in Argos you must work at the loom of another, and carry water from the spring Messes or Hyper Eia, 
All unwilling, but strong will be. The necessity upon you, and some day seeing you shedding tears a man will say of you, this is the wife of Hector, who was ever the bravest fighter of the Trojans, breakers of horses, in the days when they fought about Ilion. So will one speak of you, and for you it will be yet a fresh grief, to be widowed of such a man who could fight off the day of your slavery. But may I be dead and the piled earth hide me under before I hear you crying and know by this that they drag you captive. So speaking glorious Hector held out his arms to his baby, who shrank back to his fair-girdled nurse's bosom screaming, and frightened at the aspect of his own father, terrified as he saw the bronze and the crest with its horse hair, nodding dreadfully, as he thought, from the peak of the helmet. Then his beloved father laughed out, and his honoured mother, and at once glorious Hector lifted from his head the helmet and laid it in all its shining upon the ground. Then taking up his dear son he tossed him about in his arms, and kissed him, and lifted his voice in prayer to Zeus and the other immortals, Zeus, and you other immortals, grant that this boy, who is my son, may be as I am, preeminent among the Trojans, great in strength, as am I, and rule strongly over Ilion, and some day let them say of him, he is better by far than his father, as he comes in from the fighting, and let him kill his enemy and bring home the blooded spoils, and delight the heart of his mother. So speaking he set his child again in the arms of his beloved wife, who took him back again to her fragrant bosom smiling in her tears, and her husband saw, and took pity upon her, and stroked her with his hand, and called her by name and spoke to her, poor Andromark. Why does your heart sorrow so much for me? No man is going to hurl me to Hades, unless it is fated, but as for fate, I think that no man yet has escaped it once it has taken its first form, neither brave man nor coward. Go therefore back to our house, and take up your own work, the loom and the distaff, and see to it that your handmaidens ply their work also, but the men must see to the fighting, all men who are the people of Ilion, but I beyond others. So glorious Hector spoke and again took up the helmet with its crest of horsehair, while his beloved wife went homeward, turning to look back on the way, letting the live tears fall. And as she came in speed into the well-settled household of Hector the slayer of men, she found numbers of handmaidens within, and her coming stirred all of them into lamentation. So they mourned in his house over Hector while he was living still, for they thought he would never again come back from the fighting alive, escaping the Achaean hands and their violence. But Paris in turn did not linger long in his high house, but when he had put on his glorious armour with bronze elaborate he ran in the confidence of his quick feet through the city. As when some stalled horse who has been corn-fed at the manger breaking free of his rope gallops over the plain in thunder to his accustomed bathing place in a sweet running river and in the pride of his strength holds high his head, and the manet floats over his shoulders, sure of his glorious strength, the quick knees carry him to the loved places and the pasture of horses, so from uttermost Pergamos came Paris, the son of Priam, shining in all his armour of war as the sun shines, laughing aloud, and his quick feet carried him, suddenly thereafter he came on brilliant Hector, his brother, where he yet lingered before turning away from the place where he had talked with his lady. It was Alexandros the godlike who first spoke to him, brother, I fear that I have held back your haste, by being slow on the way, not coming in time, as you commanded me. Then tall Hector of the shining helm spoke to him in answer, strange man. There is no way that one, giving judgment in fairness, could dishonor your work in battle, since you are a strong man. But of your own accord you hang back, unwilling. And my heart is grieved in its thought, when I hear shameful things spoken about you by the Trojans, who undergo hard fighting for your sake. Let us go now, some day hereafter we will make all right with the immortal gods in the sky, if Zeus ever grant it, setting up to them in our houses the wine bowl of liberty after we have driven out of Troy the strong-grieved Achaeans.